All right, when I was 14 years old, I decided I wanted to be a weatherman, and 15 years later, I'm living my dream. So I thought I would just share the five-step framework that I followed to become a broadcast meteorologist, just in case that might be something you're considering. So how I decided I wanted to be a weatherman actually ties in with step one, which is choosing a mentor. So as a freshman in, in high school, and my dad asked me, he said, all right, Holt, like, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what do you want to study in college? And what I did was I thought about all of his different friends and who seemed to have the best life. So some of them were in I don't know, commercial real estate or sales. And he had one friend who is the chief meteorologist for KTVU in the Bay Area, actually still is. His name's Bill Martin. He's arguably the best broadcast meteorologist of all time. Great casual style. But what I did was I just thought about his life where he would go surf Ocean Beach, it seemed like every morning. He'd go into the station, he'd learn about science for a couple of hours, he'd put his forecast together. Then he'd go on television, which seemed exciting, and he'd communicate what he'd learned in a very clear and concise way. And that all just sounded very exciting to me. I'd always loved science. I'd always loved public speaking. I, I remember in the speech contest as a kid, seeing how nervous some of my classmates were, but then I would get up there and I was nervous as well, but it was kind of in a good way. I sort of enjoyed the adrenaline. So I thought, okay, here's two things that I really enjoy. I could combine them together. Bill's already doing that. His life seems awesome. Sign me up. And luckily, because my dad was friends with him, I was able to reach out and say, hey, Bill, I basically want to live your life. Like, how do I do it? And that's, I'd say, the number one reason you want to get a mentor is because when you first decide you want to do something, you don't really know how to go about it, and you also don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's much easier if you can just reach out to someone who's already doing it or has already done it, and they can just tell you the steps you should follow. So I was lucky that I knew Bill Martin. If you don't know anybody in the industry that you're interested in, you can just reach out to people randomly, and I, I can get into that a little bit later. But in my case, I knew Bill. He was stoked that I wanted to be just like him. So he got me an internship at KTVU. And I'll get into that later. But it basically kind of took that spark I had and turned it into a little fire. And it basically just made me realize, okay, this wasn't just a whim. This is actually something I want to do for the rest of my life. But the main reason you want to get a mentor again is because They've done it, so they know how to kind of coach you along the way. And that's something that Bill has done for me every step of the way is when I don't know what to do, I just call him up. He says, oh, this is what you should do. This is the best path forward in your career. And then I just do it. And that ties into step two, which is choosing a college and a major. So there's lots of ways to choose colleges, so I'm not going to dive into all of them. For me, I had some priorities. I needed to stay in California. I needed to stay on the coast. I wanted to be able to continue surfing. But then because I wanted to become a weatherman, I called Bill up. I said, okay, like, what, what should I do here? And he said, you definitely want to get the meteorology background. He said, there's kind of two paths to becoming a weatherman or a weather person. One path is the kind of more journalism route where you maybe just learn weather on the fly while you're doing the job. And then the other route is having a meteorology background. And it's usually those people who make it to the larger markets or the larger stations. So that's probably the route that you want to go. So that's what he told me. I said, Bill knows. So that's what I'm going to do. So I started to look at colleges along the California coast that had a meteorology background or meteorology major. But unfortunately, there's not many people interested in meteorology, so there's not many options. So what I did was I picked the next best thing, which was environmental earth science. And I'm actually glad that I ended up doing this because you might not know, but as weatherman, it's not just weather that you have to be able to speak about on live TV. You're kind of considered the station scientist, where if there's a volcano or a tsunami or an earthquake, they go to the weatherman to explain it. So I'm actually very glad that I had that earth science background because when those other things pop up, which actually have nothing to do with weather, I, I have some education that I can draw upon, which helps me in those moments. And it's also important because weather does interact with the world around it. It 
plays into geomorphology, soil, agriculture, all sorts of different things. So it is actually good to have that general background. But ideally, if a college you're looking at has a meteorology program, that is the, the best way you could go if you want to become a broadcast meteorologist. So I did that, went to Cal Poly, got that background. And while I was there, I went into step three, which is holding internships. So again, right off the bat, you might be thinking, okay, well, you were lucky enough to know Bill Martin and he was able to get you the internship in high school where, again, I didn't really know all that much at the time, but it at least got my foot in the door and it gave me a little experience. But when I went down to Cal Poly, I didn't really know anybody at the local TV stations down there. So I kind of was just a little annoying. <laughs> I, I think that's the best way to put it where I sent an email to KSBY and I said, hey, I'm an earth science student at Cal Poly. I've wanted to become a weatherman since I was 14. Like, can I get an internship at your station? You don't have to pay me. I'll just do as much work as I possibly can for free. Trying to make it just as sweet of a deal as possible for them. And they responded and they said, we love your passion, kid, but we don't have internships. So, I emailed them again <laughs> and then they emailed me back again saying, nope, sorry, we don't have internships. And I think I ended up emailing them like five or six times and they finally said, all right, like this kid's not going away. We created the position of internship for you. For the next four months, you can come into the station and work under Dave Hovde. And then at the end of that four months, your internship's over and you can leave us alone. <laughs> but it ended up working out perfectly because I went in the station, started getting trained by Dave Hovde, and this is where you want to understand that as an intern, it's not just what you can get from the station. You actually want to provide as much service as you can to them because that's how you're going to gain experience. That's how you're going to learn, and it also kind of makes it more worthwhile for them as well if you can kind of lessen their load in some way. So working under Dave, he explained like how things work. I was able to work on the computer, make some graphics, figure out how to put a forecast together. But I think the most useful part of holding an internship, especially if you want to become a broadcast meteorologist, is getting some time on the green screen. Now, you're going to want some time on the green screen because you're going to be bad at first. Now, this ties into step four, which is practice, practice, practice. And I say this because I purposely have not uploaded to the internet the the tape that I made at KSBY when I was in college because it is so bad that when I showed it to my own mother, she was crying of laughter watching it. <laughs> it is that maybe I'll upload it someday so that everybody can see, but it's just how it works. You know, there's lots of bright lights in here. There might be people in, in the studio who you've seen on television that are watching you. You're maybe not that familiar with the material yet. Not, it's just a lot of nerves, so you're going to be bad. It's, it's a little nerve-wracking being on camera at first. It's even still a little nerve-wracking. This is probably my eighth or ninth, ninth take of this video alone. So I, I still have a long ways to go before I can have the comfort level of a Bill Martin. But again, the more you practice, the less time you'll spend bad. That was always my mindset. I thought, okay, I'm really bad right now. There's a certain amount of hours that I need to put in before I'm somewhat decent to where I can put up a video and not cringe about it. So I should just practice as much as I can, as fast as I can to just get the bad part out of the way. And that's, I think, honestly, the best way to do it. There's lots of ways to do it. You can do it in a very simple fashion. You can just pull your phone out, talk into it, say the quick forecast for your local area and upload that to YouTube or Instagram or wherever. Or you can get a little more in depth. Like when I was in college, I bought a green screen. You can actually get them pretty cheap on Amazon. And I used to set it up in my parents' living room and I would make my slides out of PowerPoint. And then I would give little local forecasts for the Bay Area. And again, they were not good, but I was practicing. I was getting some reps in. I was also learning how to work with computers and that actually ties into this job a lot. But then there's, you could just play around with it a lot. I've done some fun facts series. I've done some educational videos. I've done more general science or weather. You can just kind of have fun with it, get creative. The one piece of advice that I do want to share that I think was the most important lesson that I learned throughout this process is 
It's very tempting early on, even later in your career as well, to be obsessed with the followers and the subscribers and the views, but you'll do much better if you just forget about that stuff and just try to make, make content that you're curious about, that kind of you get excited about, and then try to share it with other people based on what you've learned. If you're focused on the subscriber count and the views, you're probably gonna do what I was doing when I first started out, where I, I'm a little ashamed to admit this, but you know, my, my thumbnails were kind of clickbaity, my titles were kind of clickbaity, I'd, I was sensationalizing storms where, you know, for New York, I was doing national forecasts at one point. For most of New York, it was two to four inches of snow, but there might be one little area that was getting one to two feet. So then in my thumbnail and in the title of the video, I'd say, massive snowstorm coming in, one to two feet of snow. And it always just felt a little kind of dirty to me. And I, I knew what I was doing. I was trying to sensationalize things so more people would click on it so then I'd get more views. And luckily for me, that never actually worked. But even if it is working for you, you don't really want to go down that road because you end up just destroying your credibility before your career has even begun. And that's like the last thing that you want to do. You also kind of get addicted to the attention too. So then you just keep making more and more extreme content. And then eventually you become the boy who cried wolf where no one trusts your forecast because they see it and they go, oh yeah, we know what that guy's about. So it's much better to just change your mindset to I'm making these videos just to provide a service to other people. If there's some kind of big weather event going on, try to communicate it as truthfully and as well as you can. And if you do that, there actually is a market for that. Maybe not as much of an initial jump as you can get if you do go the clickbait route, but you can have much more steady growth over time. And there are a large amount of people who actually respect that kind of content and are hungry for it. So you can provide that kind of voice. And it also just makes it much more sustainable because if you get too wrapped up about a bunch of views one day, then when your next few videos get 30 views or 40 views like mine did for a couple years, then you start to get discouraged. Whereas if your content creation is just about practice, it's just about getting better, every single video you'll learn something and that'll make it all worthwhile. So I'd spent a long time talking about that, but that's because again, that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned throughout this entire journey. And it, I think perfectly encompasses the importance of practice and the mindset that you want to have around practice. So that was step four. Now step five, which is the last one that we're going to go over, is kind of optional, but I think it's actually the best move that I made in my career. Again, reached out to Bill. He coached me along on this process as well. And it's choosing a graduate school and a concentration. So as I mentioned, half of you know whether people take the journalism route half take the meteorology route very few actually go to graduate school most people at the bigger markets will try to get what's called a certificate in broadcast meteorology it comes from the american meteorological society it's basically the stamp of approval saying this broadcast meteorologist is certified by our by the meteorological society and they know what they're talking about. Not, that's not to say that people without the stamp don't know what they're talking about, but it's a certification that looks good. And that was always the big thing that Bill told me. He said, you gotta get the certificate. But when I looked into it, I realized that because I hadn't had any calculus, programming or physics background in my undergraduate, in order to get the CBM, I was gonna have to do like two years of calc physics and programming before I could even take the meteorology classes that I needed to get the certificate. So then I looked at it and I was like, okay, this might take about three years. I could just get a full master's in four years. And master's should take about two years, but again, I hadn't done calc physics or programming. So I basically went to community college for two years after undergrad to get that kind of foundation. And then I went off to graduate school. So basically I was saying, Okay, if a certificate's gonna take me three years, I might as well just get the master's, which is gonna take four years, which, you know, who knows what happens down the road if I decide to change routes at some point. That'll have a more broad applicability than just the very specific certificate. So 
I decided graduate school was a good route to go down. I also actually decided that because I still look like I was 15 coming out of undergraduate, and I thought, no one's going to put me on TV right now. I look like I could still just be one of the interns. So I thought it would probably be helpful for me to grow up a little bit. And I'm very glad that I did. The biggest reason I'd say it's useful to go to grad school, even more than just filling out the resume, is your most important job as a broadcast meteorologist is to take a lot of information, sometimes very complex information, and be able to make it clear and concise and just understandable. And I forget who said this, it's one of my favorite communication quotes, is the ultimate sign of understanding is when you can take something complex and explain it in simple terms. And in order to do that, you actually have to be able to understand it. And in order to do that, you need some background in it. So that's what grad school was about for me, where I dove more into these concepts. And now when I'm on the news, I just feel confident that I can explain, you know, why fog is forming or what the cold front is or why Santa Cruz is a little bit warmer than Monterey because of onshore winds and the ocean influence, like things like that. So that's one aspect that's very helpful is being able to explain things more clearly and concisely because you understand it more. But then also it provides you the opportunity to concentrate, to figure out what's your specialty, what's your niche, because that's one way to kind of set yourself apart from the competition. Now, when you're choosing your concentration, there's a few ways to do this. How I did it was, it was, it was a mix of things. There's the one aspect of knowing where you want to live when you grow up. For example, if you know you want to live in Florida, it could be good to focus on hurricanes. If you want to focus on winter storms, maybe you go concentrate. Or if you want to live in the Northeast, maybe you focus on winter storms. If you want to live in Oklahoma, tornadoes. I knew I wanted to live in California. We don't have hurricanes, tornadoes, usually, or really big winter storms. We do have atmospheric rivers. but the big thing we have here is wildfire and weather is one of the main things that impacts wildfire and it was actually one day when i was home and it was the big fires up in the north bay happening and it was literally raining ash on my truck and it almost just like clicked for me where i thought okay this is a big problem and we need people who understand this problem and com can communicate this problem this could be my role. Maybe this is my calling. That's my, the experiences that I've had in my life have maybe prepared me to take on this role. So it's, it's a different number of things, knowing where you want to live, but also maybe just what piques your curiosity and it might sound a little corny, but what you might be feeling called to do. And I think that ties into curiosity. Maybe what interests you is what you are supposed to do. So for me, it was wildfire. So when I was looking at grad schools, this time I was much more specific. And I said, okay, who has the best wildfire program? And lucky for me, San Jose State, which is right in the Bay Area, has the best, arguably the best wildfire program in the entire world. So I reached out to Dr. Craig Clements there. He got me in the door. And I basically just got to spend graduate school, not only building that weather background, but that wildfire background as well. So now anytime there's a big wildfire, they, the news can come to me and I, that's my specialty. That's what I feel most confident talking about. So that's, I think, pretty much sums up the five-step process that I use to become a broadcast meteorologist. I'll maybe make future videos diving in even more into each one of these steps, but hopefully this was a nice little introduction and thanks for watching.